Hey everyone, we have received a lot of questions as is obvious on A, the tele-rotations and B, how the programs are going to look at the applicants, especially the IMG applicants in this season. Uh, should I do tele-rotations? Is it actually useful? What can I learn from these tele-rotations? And then obviously how the interview season will pan out, uh, what specific skills over and above say in the previous seasons will the programs be looking for as they evaluate your applications and they invite you for the interviews. I had the opportunity to interview Dr. Cedric Coleman and uh, Dr. Tabitha Watts. Uh, Dr. Coleman is with Rush University and Dr. Watts is with Cook County Hospital. So we discussed a wide range of issues from, from tele-rotations to the future of telehealth and rotations. And then what will the programs look for in the coming seasons and how should IMGs, uh, students like you, prepare yourself as you work on your applications, as you uh, do these rotations and prepare for the season in general. So take a listen and let us know if you need any additional help or information and we'll be able to help you with that. Good luck for the season. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, we have received hundreds of questions on tele-rotations from many of you. It's usefulness for the IMGs and how programs will assess the US clinical experience. And to answer many of these questions, to, today we have a very distinguished panel. Uh, Dr. Cedric Coleman, who's Associate Professor of Medicine at Rush University Medical Center, and Dr. Tabitha Watts, who's the attending physician at uh, Pediatrics Emergency Medicine at Cook County Hospital. So, uh, and of course we do have uh, Ms. Toya Banks. Uh, all of our students uh, go to Ms. Toya Banks for tele-rotations when they have to work with uh, Dr. Coleman and uh, Dr. Watts. So she is the CEO of r and IMG Clinicals. And our students obviously love the rotations with Dr. Coleman and Dr. Watts. We send them dozens of students every month. And given their experience and passion for teaching, we wanted to get their thoughts on some of the most pressing questions that many of you have asked us. So welcome Dr. Coleman and welcome Dr. Watts. I think she just stepped out because she's on call today. But uh, welcome Dr. Coleman. Well, thank you very much. So let me start with you, Dr. Coleman. Uh, you know, talk to us about the benefits of tele-rotations, especially for our audience, which tends to be IMGs from other countries or even maybe in, in the US. But what are the potential benefits for these tele-rotations? Well, first of all, as you know, with the pandemic, that's really made the tele-rotations uh, essentially necessary. Even within Chicago, with Rush, University of Illinois, Cook County, and the West Side VA hospitals, we're all within walking distance of each other. But yet, because of the pandemic, we don't share students, we don't share residents, only the attending physicians go from facility to facility because we want to keep the, the carriage rate and the infection rate low. So even within our own community, within a couple of blocks of each other, we don't go across borders. Uh, and that's where the tele-rotations really come and are very special. With the tele-rotations, at least what we've tried to do, we try to focus on what program directors were looking at, the clinical experience, the medical knowledge, but more so the medical knowledge. Because by the time people have gotten to me, they would have done internal medicine, they would have done some of the medical subspecialties, they would have done uh, their core clerkships. So they should have had enough patient experience if we use that term. Now what we want to do is, is, is really, uh, really hone in on their skills. So when the program directors evaluate them and they get them, they know that that person is ready to evaluate the patient on the floor and do what they need to do as an intern. It's not just a matter of seeing 100 patients with COPD. It's a matter of seeing 10 patients with COPD and know what to do with them overnight to save their life and to, to make the whole system run better. So we're focusing now more on critical thinking, putting cases together, and things like that. So in our program, everything we do is clinical. 
from the time that we do case presentations and discuss the literature, the clinical findings, as if they're actually seeing that patient and walking through everything, through what we have with the simulation lab with Dr. Watts and at Cook County, to have doing simulated patients under certain conditions, and even now adding on our medical records, our EMR. So when we go through the EMR now, we do a case presentation. And now, just like they would do with discussing the case, they're going to go through the EMR and order the test according to the data and everything we talked to before. So we're making everything as much of a clinical experience as possible. Because like I said, again, it's not just getting the patients and seeing the patients. It's can we do critical thinking once we get there? Now, Everything is in flux. The program directors are looking at this. We're looking at this and everybody's kind of changing on the spot. They know most people aren't going to be coming in and being able to do live rotations. And even for the people that are here that could potentially do live rotations, the patients may not want them in the room because they'll say, Dr. Coleman, okay, I got you. I got your, your staff here. We don't want an extra person in here. And of course, the patients get to, to make that choice. So we're trying to make everything as academic clinical and critical thinking as much as possible. So that person is ready day one to be on the floor, but they did it through us with the simulation lab and the case presentations, the literature discussion that we go through, or if they potentially have done a live rotation. And I think with the way we do it, we're getting more, more academic a patient interaction, through the way we present everything, I think they get more with the telerotation than they really do with some of the clinical rate rotations, especially if all they're doing is observation. What they, what they fail to realize sometimes with just observation, they're just there. They don't get to participate. They don't get to talk. They don't get invited to all the conferences here. They're getting all of the literature on everything that we're talking about. And we have an agenda that we want to go through within a month. And we're doing everything to prepare them to be a good physician, um, to be a good resident, and to prepare for boards. So we have a threefold um, uh, focus on what we're working on. Excellent. And, thank you. Thank you, and Dr. The program directors uh, are I do want to... With what we did. Mm -hmm. So I, I do want to dig a, deep, a bit deeper on the simulation lab that you've just started. Very innovative concept. So can you talk a bit, uh, maybe Dr. Watts, about the simulation lab and how... Uh, how does it enrich the student experience? Okay, well, well sim, sim simulation lab or sim-based teaching has been um, a, a method of teaching for, for, for quite some time. It's just really been more formalized lately with uh, it probably in the last 10 years with significant um, uh, resources put into creating simulation labs and training actual simulation teams so that that's their focus um, all over the country. Uh, so in particularly what the sim lab does is that it offers an environment where you can um, really go through real life cases with a mannequin that has real life physiology, um, pathophys as well as normal physiology, and you can go through the cases in basically a protected environment, but as real life as as you know as equal to real life except for the the, the patient as a mannequin. And what that does is one, it definitely allows for um, learners to be able to practice their skills in real time. It's, uh, we are, we're all aware of how, you know, experience is, is the best teacher. And oftentimes when you're doing things, when you're talking about doing it or when you're doing multiple choice tests, that's very different than being in the moment, making these decisions, having to um, uh, really actively decide, you, you know, in, in the moment with the, with the patient. And so the sim lab basically reproduces that environment, but again, it's protected. Uh, we have learning objectives we can actually control what the patients come in with and, um, and, and, and what that, that looks like. And we can determine and, and identify areas where um, we really want people, want the learners to, to the specific objectives for those cases. Uh, and so we can make sure that we evaluate them and allow them to, to do that. Sorry, I have to step away again. That's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Coleman, uh, let me ask you, when when students come to you, right? One is the the learnings that they get from tele rotation, and second is their preparation, especially the IMG students. So, what is your expectation that students should have 
you know, what kind of skills or background already to utilize the tele rotations to the, the most. And second, what, how can they maximize their learnings from the tele rotation? So what should be in their background? What preparation should they already do before they come in? And then how can they maximize the learnings? Well, other than the fact that they did their rotations, we, I do recommend that they would have done an internal medicine rotation. And had they done any um, subspecialty rotations, that would help, but it's not necessarily. Uh, what we don't really do is have people where this is their, their first rotation, their first core rotation, and they haven't had anything else. Be Although we've had people that have done that, I've had three people where this was the first thing they've ever had, and they've all matched the first time they um, applied for programs, because we do have a fairly good match rate. If they come in with the internal medicine knowledge, we have a program where we go through all the basic things, like in, in the United States the five major drivers for hospital admissions, COPD, asthma, CHF, coronary disease, hypertension, diabetes. We put a big focus at and take them through that on not only just knowing the clinical process, knowing where the data came from to make the decisions, because they'll talk about protocols. So we go through where the data came from to make those protocols so we can make changes in the future and we could do critical thinking in between the line on the patient with the protocol. protocol. Everything is done in a case presentation. So we're taking them through the case, the physical exam, the laboratory data, uh, the laboratory data. And then we talk about the literature that supports the treatment with that. We take that then on Friday and then they're in the STEM simulation lab and we give them something, uh, a case presentation there that was similar to what they went through. So they can actually have a patient to see how the data we assess works in real life. So, so we're trying to get them as close as possible to being ready as an intern. And then again, when they go through the EMR, it's another small case presentation. But now when they're talking about the medication they want to use, and we're talking about the literature, they're actually going through the EMR and ordering the test. So we try to make everything as clinical as possible and as academic as possible. One, for them to be a good clinical physician. And, and I talked to one program director we had, we had a student who was with us who had not done a clinical rotation for 10 years. Mm -hmm. she, had been doing, um, she had been doing research in dermatology at University of Pennsylvania. She did her, she did her telerotation with us. She did six weeks. After the match this past year, she lettered different programs to see if they still had slots available for people who, did, who couldn't come. She ended up uh, talking to the program director at Florida International there they liked everything about her, but they were concerned about the, the lack of clinical preparation over the last 10 years. I called the program director, explained our program like I am to you on exactly what we do. He told me, he said, okay, I'll get back in touch with her. So to me, thinking he was going to get back in touch with her meant he may call her tomorrow. So as soon as we hung up the phone, I called her to let her know that I talked to the program director, but she, she texted me to let me know that he, she was on the phone with him and he offered her the position right there. I would have convinced that they get, they, if anything, more clinical hands-on knowledge because we can do everything. We don't have to wait for a patient. We have the simulation lab. But when we do our case presentations, we go through it step by step. You know, the history, the physical exam, the findings, the labs, uh, what we think our differential is in that patient, not what it sounds like in the textbook. What our differential is in that patient because of the labs, and we're able to go through and, and do our work. And, and it's worked out pretty good in doing that. Thank you. And, Talking and, to the program director. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh -huh. Yes, so that was going to be my next question. You know, you talk to program directors all the time. You know what specific things uh, they they are looking for so any you know the top three or four things that program directors look for especially in this uh, new post covid era what what would you say are the few things program directors will look for or are looking for as they assess the imgs in terms of their readiness to start the uh, residency <clears throat> okay uh, first of all, after we got through all the confusion, <laughs> because there, there was a lot of confusion and yeah. nobody knew what they were looking for at all. But then we were able to kind of slow the tide down. One, they do want to see if everything that they're going through in the, in the tele-rotations have major clinical value. 
That's the big thing. Are they being able to go through things to help them to assess patients, to make a good differential diagnosis, to be able as, as close as possible to a, um, a, a real clinical experience, to be able to make a diagnosis in that patient. Like I tell the students sometimes, it's not a matter of seeing 100 patients with COPD. It's a matter of seeing 10 patients with COPD and knowing the best way to manage those patients. And they want to see, so when we tell them what we do, when we do our case and presentations, how we go through the medications, how we go through where the literature came from to, to produce those medications, how we have them also in asking questions for boards. Because again, it's a three-pronged project to prepare them to be a good resident, but also to prepare them for boards. A lot of them have been pretty confident in what we're doing. And when we've been in the medical center and then knowing us, U of I, U of C, University of Chicago and Northwestern and Loyola, we kind of all know each other. So they know the package that we're trying to put together. And they know if I'm writing a letter for someone, you know, I mean what I say. If they're good, they're good. If I can't write a letter for a person to be good, I won't like, write a letter. I'll keep yeah. working with them until they're good enough for me to write, write a letter for them. But but with, with, with the programs, they know that I'm going to stand behind the product I'm presenting for them, and that's our student. So we try to make sure they're getting the best clinical knowledge as possible. They want to make sure that they are trained, that they feel comfortable if they're trained by somebody they know. Again, it's more of a comfort thing than anybody else. So in the academic world, we all kind of know each other. So if I call them and say, hey, I have this person I really want you to take a look at. They really take it seriously. They know I don't call them a lot, and they do really take it seriously. The other thing, uh, along with the, the, the telerotations, I know this year a third of the interviews that students are going to have, even for people in the United States, are going to be distant interviews. They're mm -hmm. going to be tele-interviews because of the back and forth. So even with that, that's coming in to play a role. But we try to make sure we let them know that they get a good, strong clinical and academic background. And, and I tell them, I tell them, even when I'm doing this and I have people in my office, I don't think I could do a better coverage of the clinical and the academic data that I do with the telerotation because we, we have a free reign. We're not waiting for anything. We're not waiting for the patients to come in. We're starting and we can go. We, we have experience from the type of patients that we see all the time. And we try to make sure that everything we do and the telerotation matches what we do in the office or what we would do in the emergency room, what we do in urgent care. So they get a broad feel of everything. And again, even the clinical data we do on the EMR, you know, it's a case presentation, even though they're going and ordering, going and ordering tests, now they're ordering tests according to what they talked about in the case discussion. And with that, the, a lot of program directors do feel confident with the clinical training they're getting. Because the biggest thing was, are they really getting kind of clinical training or are they just kind of there waiting for patients to come in? So we yeah. try to make the best use of that time as possible. Thank you. Uh, okay, I think Dr. Watts is still busy. Uh, <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me ask you, where do you see the future of tele-rotations, say even post-COVID world? What is the future hold for telemedicine telehealth and specifically the tele-rotations? This is gonna be the this is gonna be the new future. Okay, this is the new the new the new normal in some form or fashion. So like now, even as the summer is winding down, my patients now are getting ready. Okay, it's gonna be in the fall. We're gonna start doing our 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 office visit online, right? Or over the phone. Because now they Medicare will cover for phone calls, or if the patient has an iPhone for FaceTime, or mm -hmm. if they have WhatsApp on time like that. So with Medicare and the insurance is participating more and paying for that for the patients, matter of fact, the patients like it better than coming into the office, especially the older patients. Um, this, is, this isn't going to change. This is going to be with us. And, and knowing now, especially with our immigration problem in the United States, haven't resolved anything. And with things that are happening within the medicine itself, with maybe not even being able to take... Um, uh, um, what the, the CS uh, clinical skills exam, a lot of stuff is going to be done at medical school. The telerotation is, is going to be here. It's going to be here, one, predominantly over the next three years, and it's going to be here definitely as an assist if when people do start to come back and do rotations, it's going to be there available also. 
So Dr. Watts uh, is yes. back. So yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Watts, uh, I, I know you're quite busy. So at this point, but, but let me ask you the same similar questions I asked yes. Dr. Coleman in terms of, uh, you know, you interview students, you've seen all the IMGs and you see what programs are looking for in the IMGs when it comes to the US clinical experience, telerotations. So give us some insights into what you think in the coming season or seasons program directors will focus on uh, when it comes to the foreign medical graduates in terms of their skills, experience, education. So, so, so because of the, the um, pandemic and, and Dr. Coleman may have touched on this, um, I know for sure at our institution, all of our, uh, all of our interviews are virtual. Um, and I believe that is the case across the country. I believe that all of the interviews are going to be virtual. I don't think there are going to be any in-person interviews happening. And because of that, one of the, the main, uh, the, so the things that we usually glean from an interview, right, we're trying to get to know, uh, get a sense of the, 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 the candidate to get a sense of their, you know, of course, um, pr presentation skills. So how they present themselves, what their personality is, if they are someone that we want to work with with basically so the same sort of focus I mean I do think that you know of course the 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 applicant's profile is going to be looked at uh, for sure, right? So definitely the personal statement is going to be one of the, it's always, and it, now it's going to even have to carry an even heavier load, mm -hmm. um, is, is going to be one of the main things that we look like look at. We want, you know, we want to get a sense of the candidate from the personal statement. And then in the interview, which we also as where is going to be virtual, that is something we're going to have to garner um, basically from, from those main aspects so that's going to be one of the one of the biggest things and we would rely pretty heavily on the interaction of the candidate as they uh, present themselves at the actual interview but we recognize now that's we're, we're going to have to tune up our assessment skills <laughs> from a virtual standpoint apparently uh, so that's going to be one of the big biggest things and 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 with that is again going to be the candidate's ability to present themselves so communication is going to be key right their ability to communicate uh, why they want to be at this program, why, why they want this particular discipline, basically things that they should be able to communicate um, regardless of how they, what rotations or how they have rotated in an environment. And that's one way where I believe that telerotations actually help in addition because mm -hmm. often the students are very comfortable with thinking that, you know, they know um, a case or they know how to manage, but you should be able to walk and talk through a case and how you would approach the patient because that is also what you're doing as a senior resident, as an attending, right? You're getting phone calls from, from residents who are your eyes and ears in the hospital asking for guidance or agreement on the patients that they're seeing. So they should be able to demonstrate those skills and those are skills that they are honing in addition to, of course, the, the clinical knowledge base. They're honing that oral, um, uh, the, you know, the, the communication skills that, that, that is needed. Okay. Um... Any two or three improvement opportunities that you may have seen consistently with IMGs as part of your interaction, what they should in general be working on, what you have seen they could improve on, anything that uh, stands out for you? Um, again, honestly, communication is is a big part, um, and and honestly, confidence in their in their medical skills. Mm -hmm. I think um, because the application culture may be very different in terms of it being a lot more objective um, from where they are in, in the manner that they have been trained, where there's a lot more objectivity and subjectivity, um, a lot more subjectivity that's involved um, from the U.S. training side. Uh, they need to be confident in, 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 in their clinical skills. And from that, they can communicate, this is what I would do. This is what I'm thinking. Um, so I have found that they have gained a lot more confidence and understanding and, and, and their ability to um, kind of integrate all of the information that they have from doing telerotations. 
previously it was, I read a case, I take a test. If the test says that I've got 90%, then I know what I'm doing. Now it's a read a case, whether or not I take a test or I get a test from, from Dr. Watts or Dr. Coleman, I read the, I read the, uh, the literature and then I walk through the actual case, um, whether it's us talking directly presenting cases or whether it's in the sim lab. So I feel like it is very much a more integrated and holistic approach to patient care that they're receiving with with the telerotations. Excellent, excellent. Uh, all right, I think we are coming at the top of our uh, interview time, but I do want to bring in uh, Ms. Toya Banks, if, if you're still there, uh, uh, Ms. Banks. Uh, are you on mute? She's she's muted. I'm here. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I'm here. Uh, you know this was this was great. And uh, any advice, any thoughts that you may have for students uh, who may be interested in tele rotations? Anything that you may want to say? The only thing that I could think to say is tele rotations, telehealth, telemedicine is the way of the future. And I believe if you're coming in now on the end of telerotation, you're, you're actually ahead of the game. This is what it's going to look like in the future. Everybody wants to think that hands-on being there and is more important. This is a learning curve. To me, you get more knowledge, you get more uh, clinical information on the patient than so many people together trying to learn about one patient when you're one-on-one -on -one with your doctor or your preceptor doing tele-rotation. So I believe this is a big benefit and it will only make your CV shine brighter. Yeah, oh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Banks. So I appreciate the time, Dr. Coleman, uh, Dr. Watts. Uh, I hope we can do more of these interviews to help the IMGs. Okay. And I, again, appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing your perspective with us and uh, uh, hopefully you have a good day. I know you're very <laughs> busy you. running around. Sorry, but, yes, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate uh, it.